Good morning. Good morning, uh, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank um, our host, Dr. Raibarike, for the hospitality and also to Afi for giving me the opportunity to moderate um, this panel on financial inclusion and women economic empowerment. Now, there is some empirical evidence that suggests a strong positive correlation between a country economic development and its financial inclusion. The World Bank considers financial inclusion a key enabler to reduce extreme poverty and boost shared prosperity. In fact, financial inclusion has been identified as an enabler for seven of 17 sustainable development goals. Still, despite many progress made, an estimated 2 billion people don't have basic accounts. Most of them are concentrated in developing countries. By engaging directly with regulators from different countries from all continents, providing a platform for best practices sharing and capacity building, aligning to financial inclusion has significantly contributed to financial inclusion agenda. But financial inclusion needs to be inclusive. So when the figure shows that there is a 9% gender gap in access to financial services, AFI sees an opportunity to push further its agenda by introducing the Dinara National Plan. Because AFI believes that benefit, the benefits of financial inclusion can be amplified by both men and women as equal citizens have equal opportunity to access financial services. Now, the the Dinara Action Plan seeks to address the key barriers to women financial inclusion that fall within the scope of the control and influence of financial regulators and policy makers in developing and emerging countries. Ladies and gentlemen, in the words of Christina Gia, gender equality and women economic empowerment is not only a moral obligation but an economic necessity particularly in the background of uncertainty in the already slow economic recovery, the aging populations in some developed and developing countries, and also uncertainty in the global trade policy direction. Now, understanding the relationship between financial inclusion and women economic empowerment and what relevant key actors can do to advance the implementation of the Dinara Action Plan will be the objective of this session. Before we start the session, we would like to show you a video of the um, Gender and Women Financial Inclusion Committee and the um, I'll, I'll just let the, uh, the video show you and then let you see for yourself. Um, I think everyone needs to play a role and I think the best way that AFI can come in in, in this um, global gender agenda is on financial inclusion um, because this is what AFI uh, knows best. I think uh, the actions are going to be local or national, but always a forum like uh, AFI, uh, which is global in nature, is always important where people come and um, learn from each other, uh, make commitments. Uh, actually, when you make a commitment, it's like you're making yourself accountable to the whole world and uh, build partnerships. Uh, I, I think uh, we need a global um, uh, effort but the implementation, of course, is going to happen on the local grounds. So the Women's Financial Inclusion Committee of AFI has been set up to really try and coordinate the efforts that we are all doing at national level to see how we can intensify the the work that is being done at the national level 
and like I've already indicated, it's for us to be able to share experiences. I believe that uh, AFI taking on board the issue of gender and women's financial inclusion is a real game changer. Uh, it's going to very positively impact this issue and uh, the manner in which it's, it's being approached through all the working groups um, and uh, also with the possibility of using the entire AFI platform uh, from members to partners to collaborators. I see that there will really be real impact on women's financial inclusion. And it is my hope that within five years, if not totally eradicated, the gender gap will have significantly diminished. I would also like to announce that as of yesterday at the AFI ATM, at the uh, Committee on Gender and Women Financial Inclusion has been um, set up as a permanent committee um, at the AFI. Uh, at AFI. So uh, congratulations to all the members of the committee. Now, um, I would like to start the session by uh, giving you all to Ms. Kelsen from the Gates Foundation to present to you the relationships between financial inclusion and economic empowerment. I'm going to wait to see where the slides come up first. Thank you. But if they don't, I will just talk anyway. <laughs> I am from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and I work on the financial services for the poor team. Around the world, as you know, there's been great news over the last five years. Since 2011, 2012, 500 million more people have bank and mobile money accounts than just five years ago. This is a revolution in financial inclusion, but it is expensive to be poor. Most poor people live ordinary financial lives. They buy food, pay doctor's bills, school fees, borrow money when they need it, and save when they can. But in an informal economy, the poor are always made disadvantage. They have the money to buy goods in small amounts, but such affordable quantities are hard to find. When they need to borrow, they lack leverage, so they pay astronomical fees and interest rates. If they are cheated or robbed, they have little recourse. However, in emerging digital economies, conducted largely by mobile phones at this point, we can lower those transaction costs to near zero. As mobile phone ownership and cellular signal coverage expands throughout developing countries, it will be easier for banks and other financial service providers to make money by, afford by offering affordable financial services to the poor. But what about poor women? Oh, there are my slides. I'm going to back them up a few slides. There has been Global progress towards financial inclusion, especially in the poorest of 40% of households. Account penetration rates for women went from 47% to 58% between 2011 and 2014, according to the Global Findex. And we are anxiously awaiting a new data from the Global Findex to see if that has improved as well. However, while women made gains during this time, they are not making gains relative to men. As mentioned earlier, there's a persistent gender gap of 9% in account ownership across developing economies. Forty-two percent of all women, a billion women, are outside the formal financial system. A billion women. Here you can see some common indicators of digital financial service usage 
from the 2016 intermediate surveys. And you can see that in some cases, the gender gap is growing as usage of digital financial service grows. And the band that you see on the slide is a band of the gap through time. Oops, and that's done. There it is. It's the band of the gap through time on three, uh, three items, mobile phone ownership, active digital accounts, and usage of advanced services in four countries. Kenya, Pakistan, India, Nigeria, Tanzania, five countries. And you can see through time that band gets a little bit bigger. So how can we ensure that as UC Digital Financial Services grows in our countries, that that band and that gender gap is not getting wider? Well, I first want to talk to you a little bit about what we are leaving on the table when women are not financially included. We know that X, having access to control over income is a critical way for poor women to help lift themselves and their families out of poverty. Significant GDP gains could be realized if women were fully participating in their economies by being fully financially included. As you know, the G20 in recent years agreed on the clear need to enable women's full financial participation in their economies. In the 2014 G20 Leaders Communique, they established the goal of reducing the gap in participation rates between men and women in our countries by 25% by 2025 in order to significantly increase global growth and reduce poverty and inequality. There is a strong connection between financial, financial inclusion, economic empowerment, and labor force participation. Many of you have probably seen the 2015 research by the McKinsey Global Institute. So if you believe there is a connection between those three things, these numbers are really astounding. If we close the gender gap in workforce participation by women, we could be, it could yield $12 trillion of incremental global GDP by 2025, with the greatest opportunity for gains in South Asia, the Middle East, and North Africa. But financial inclusion for women is a critical part of this equation. If women are going to be economically empowered, or many of you may have heard me say this at the AFI conference last year in Fiji, we must create a gender-inclusive financial system. I'm going to show you a little bit of evidence, especially a couple of studies that have emerged in the last year, that show the important connection between financial inclusion and economic empowerment. The evidence demonstrates that financial inclusion is a powerful tool. It can reduce poverty and it has outsized effects for women in many cases. Let's look at three studies. There it is. In Kenya, Surrey and Jack studied the use of Mpesa for seven years. And what they found was that over that time period, 186,000 households were lifted out of extreme poverty in Kenya. That's 2% of the households in Kenya. The impacts on occupational choice during that time and consumption were more pronounced for women and female head of households. Women who were, who were using uh, M-Pesa in Kenya chose more often than men to come out of informal employment and into more formal employment. Having a private, low-cost means of managing financial resources via digital money can meaningfully reduce poverty rates among vulnerable groups. Increase digital financial services, increase labor force participation, decrease poverty. In India, Dr. Rohini Pandey, a group from Harvard Kennedy School, under the auspices of the Evidence and the Policy Design, are just now completing a study, and the midline for this study was very exciting. They studied the Agrego Workforce Program in India, in the state of Madhya Pradesh. Now it's the law in India for monies for this program to flow into women's accounts, but in practice, often those monies go into head of household accounts. 
Dr. Pandey and her colleagues studied what would happen if you digitized this payment stream, made it flow into women's accounts, and provided training to the women on the use of these accounts. The early results were astonishing. Women's annual earnings increased by 24%. Women whose rate of payments were deposited into their accounts were more likely to engage in economic transactions outside the household, especially with their own money. And they found a very interesting intra-household dynamic benefit. Men whose wives participated in the Enrago program and had this additional training and changed their occupation, those men were 16% less likely to describe their wives as housewives. So increasing women's control over her income can encourage labor force participation, I maintain, in settings where male preferences constrain female employment. Digitization of social protection programs could draw more women in as active users in the formal financial sector. Increase women's control of resources, increase labor force participation, reduce poverty. And finally, a study by Jenny Aker and her colleagues, and she may be in the audience today, so Jenny, I apologize if I butchered the results of your infamous study now. In 2014, Jenny and her colleagues studied what would happen if you digitized a mobile cash transfer program in Niger. In response to a drought, they took monthly cash transfers to 10,000 households, and they were delivered through mobile or manual methods. And they found that households that received the mobile payments purchased a wider set of goods, had significant, statistically significant greater diet diversity, and depleted fewer household assets. Children consumed more meals per day. Women in particular grew more cash crops. Mobile money is a cost-effective means of providing cash transfers to rural populations. Greater privacy and time safety may result in international decision making and give women more influence. Increase digitization of transfers, increase household decision making, decrease poverty. So what do we need to do to financially include one billion women to see these effects? What has proven itself already as a viable online? Now, I'm not going to bore you with the in detail uh, of these five countries, but we at the Gates Foundation recently did a scan across what countries have increased their gender gap account ownership, in some cases to zero, using digitization of government payments. And I'm going to talk in particular just briefly about Mongolia and South Africa. Mongolia, between 2005 and 2012, introduced a digital payment to its citizens, distributing revenues from mineral and mining sectors. They, made, they started making electronic deposits into people's accounts. They now have the largest share of adults receiving government payments directly in the bank accounts. The percentage of account owners in Mongolia who made three plus withdrawals in a month is three times larger than the national than the regional average. And in terms of poverty alleviation, they estimate that there's been a 12% reduction in poverty incidence, and they've reduced the poverty gap by 21% in Mongolia, and the gender gap in account ownership is zero. In South Africa, between, two, between 1994 and 2014, the South Africa Social Security Agency integrated nine provincial departments into one department, and in response to fraud and corruption, all the beneficiaries were required to register with the organization, and then their information was collected and stored on a biometric ID card. They increased the benefit recipients from 3 million to 16 million people in that time. So in terms of financial inclusion, 41% of women now receive government payments, 80% of those dollars are paid into women's accounts, zero gender gap in account ownership. And I can't leave this slide, frankly, without mentioning the case of Iran. 92% of adults in Iran are banked. In 2010, Iran switched an energy subsidy uh, 
uh, energy price subsidy into a direct transfer to its citizens and forced everyone to open an account and zero gender gap and account ownership in Iran. So what is the opportunity side of digitizing cash transfers? We did a quick scan across our eight focus countries, four in Asia, India, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Pakistan, four in Africa, Nigeria, Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania, and we came up with sizable figures for the opportunity size of digitizing these programs, bringing more women into formal financial inclusion up to 63 million across those countries digitizing GDP cash transfers. And in terms of wages, and that shouldn't say GDP wages, that's an error, I apologize. Please don't tell Bill Gates I showed the slide with the error. The opportunity size is large, but look at the numbers under women who have mobile phones but no accounts. These numbers are rough, but somewhere in the magnitude of 250, 275 million. So the opportunity size is large. It may not close the gap entirely, but it's a fantastic start. What needs to be in place to financially include 100 million more women by 2020, 2022? You all will play a key role. Let's design payment systems that work for women. Let's pay them into women's accounts and not head of household. Let's set some bold goals. Can we work together to put a digital ecosystem in place that would support additional accounts for the poor? Can we identify those social payment streams that would help financially include poor women? I will look forward to hearing the words of our esteemed panelists today. And thank you for your attendance at today's session. Talking about women, we have one man here on the panel. Um, Governor from uh, the Central Government of Mozambique. My apologies for Mozambique. Um, now, I, I, because you are the only fan on the panel, I want to put you on the spot. Do you believe in women economic empowerment? Mm -hmm. Economic empowerment. I have no choice. Thank you. I think if, if all the men in the world share your belief, you will be talking about women economic empowerment. Governor, how have you sought to address women economic empowerment in the example that you share with us? Yes, yes, yes. So, thank you very much to the opportunity to share the Mozambican experience on financial inclusion issues, especially in what pertains to the questions of women participation and usage of financial services. But before that, I would like to seize this opportunity on behalf of my colleagues at the Central Bank of Mozambique, who are represented here, to thank our host for a superb hospitality. We are all thrilled to be in Egypt, to be in Shad Mashman. All of us, it is the first time that we have made it. So it means a lot. And uh, we will take with us back home to the Central Bank, to our family, to our community, the experience and the world of welcome that we have received from the Egyptian people. So thank you very much. Focusing now to address the question that was raised here 
I would first of all to say that uh, the way we see it in Mozambique is that uh, pretty much in line with what happened with our peers in the continent. We still have an issue of financial inclusion for women. And that is even more serious because you need to look into a context where access to financial services for the overall countries, both men and women, is very low. So when you put it in that context, the situation is even more severe than what we have applied in terms of numbers, in terms of gaps between women and men. Another interesting point to highlight is that there are tremendous disparities across the country. The country almost 30 million people, it's long, almost over 3,000 kilometers of coasts along the Indian Ocean. We have a situation of urban areas, one world, and you go to rural areas, you have a totally different world. So if you get to the real world, financial exclusion is a way of life. I would say we have not even started just to be more clear about it. So the rural population, the problems of financial exclusion of female women, it's really severe. Uh, now, if you, another interesting point is that when we look at our laws, constitution and numbers of laws, we are less discrimination between women and gender on any The laws are very clear since independent. We have inherited, you know, Mozambique, for those who are not know, who is a former Portuguese partner who came in independence in 1975. And back then, we still had laws that basically have a law. If you, man, if you as a female, you wanted to do any economic activity, even getting a job, you needed to ask formal permission from your husband. And all these laws were scrapped at independence time. So starting from the constitution, the jury, we had equality. <laughs> But in practice, there's still a way, a long way to go. Because of that equality, it allows us at this point to say that when you look at the indicators of access to financial services, which are low for everybody, there's not much disparity between men and women. You know, we're almost plus 40 plus years of independence. Then you ask me, where is the problem? The problem is not so much in access, it's so much in usage of financial services. There are tremendous disparities, gaps between men and women in the users of financial services, and they are even more exacerbated, remarkably, in the rural areas. There are many reasons. I will just mention three of them, just for simplifying. That has to do with social and cultural constraints that are there. They have to do with the level of education. They have to do things that really address the sense of my Hey, wait, such know your customers, which are tied to the formal regulatory system. Now, I want to stress that these problems that we have in terms of usage, it's with pertaining the formal system. We have many banks, ATT, pretty much covering different number. But we have some peculiar issues there because our banking system is pretty much formal. By, I would say, 90% of the deposit assets are owned by banks, which are owned by foreign entities and foreign capital. So, creating the sensitivity of institutions 
which key decisions are not taken in the country but are taken at their headquarters, mostly in Portugal and elsewhere. That becomes a challenge. How do you deal with the financial, the formal financial system to address the issues of financial inclusion, especially for women? So what has happened? Because we, the formal financial system does not respond to the needs of women, we find ourselves in a very embarrassing situation that most women and most women, to some extent, we have a number of informal financial schemes, credit, deposit, equality, and more than two thirds are operating, managed, and open by women. What it means is that the formal financial system that is still there, for the most part, is still serving mostly men and not much. If females want to get some service, they have to operate in the informal system, which is inefficient, which is fairly highly costly, and so that's the problem that we are facing. So, informality is a way of life, and especially for the rural areas, because there are no banks. The formal institutions, they don't exist in the rural areas. There are no banks, there are no branch, there are no ATM machines. So, that's the only way you can operate. One point that I would like to, then the question is, what are we doing? I'm sure that will be the next question. There are many things. We have initiated the process. It's a long journey. It's not an easy task. And, and what we have noticed is if you are going to achieve any meaningful results, policy makers, both at the center of government and government and others, need to operate in partnership with others. There is a role for everybody to play in the public sector and the private sector. The laws are there, so that initial journey has been has taken place. So we have institutions like banks, like the electronic money making institutions. We have many others who are initiated. We are still at the very embryonic stage at this point. And so that's my hope that in the future we can achieve better results. So I can summarize that we have initiated the journey, it's a long journey, we know where we want to go, but we are not yet there. But we are making efforts. And with the help of Africa and the membership and others who have made progress in this area, we hope to move even faster than we have done so far. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. That's a very good start. Um, and you mentioned in your interventions that one of the problems is that women do have access, but the, the, the usage is a bit lesser. And I understand that in Egypt you have a financial literacy uh, strategy, and you also have a, a women's economic and cultural campaign uh, from yesterday. So, uh, Dr. Morsi from the National Council for Women in Egypt, how have you looked at the role of financial inclusion within the, uh, the council for the objective for women uh, empowerment? Good morning and thank you very much for giving the chance actually to the National Council for Women to be the only national women machine representing uh, women voice. So I have a, a real burden not only to speak about women in Egypt or Egyptian women, but I think that I have uh, to deliver a message on the women from all your countries. Yes. The National Council for to, to think or to visualize the financial inclusion is not only, uh, we should not only have a financial inclusion strategy uh, that is handled by, with the Central Bank of Egypt. The Central Bank of Egypt was so responsive that when we were the, uh, at the National Council for Women developing 
the national strategy of Egypt, Egypt Vision 2030. They went with us on board, so the financial inclusion as a strategy was also included in the women's strategy and has a specific indicators for monitoring. We're establishing the Women Observatory that has uh, specific indicators on economic empowerment and financial inclusion, and this will also provide sex segregated data from users, from women on the ground, as well as from banks in Egypt through the central bank. Third, it's very interesting to keep on saying the know you customer uh, strategy. In Egypt, we're trying to tweak it. The customer has to know you. So the, through the knocking door campaigns of the uh, National Council of Women, we're going to trickle down the services of the, the banks and the, the, the uh, inclusion, inclusion, financial inclusion services or packages to the women at the ground level. In, in 2017, the National Council of Women reached one, more than 1.1 1 .1 million women knocking door. This means that we are entering their houses, talking to them, discussing their problems, and actually, as well, giving them a sense of uh, a lot of knowledge, uh, training, and delivering certain messages. So know your business or know your customer need also to know that your customer needs to know you. This is the third thing. We, we were announcing yesterday the journey of Egypt and we were so proud to be part of this journey. Uh, the journey will continue with the village saving lending associations that are uh, where was announced yesterday with the partnership of EU, CARE and UN Women, but also we have asset transfer for the poorest of the poor, economic empowerment programs that will target women to enter to the market sector, but we're tracking the problem from the beginning. We have to have all ensuring that women have identification cards because this is a value chain of economic empowerment. Having a, an ID card will lead mostly at a certain moment to the financial inclusion sector. Fourth, it's the campaign reaching out to social media. Social media do work with illiterate women and illiterate women. So reaching out with several messages to uh, virtual or social media also succeeded. As I announced yesterday, the Secret of Your Power campaign, being a productive a per person or individual in the community, reached out to more than 42 million uh, uh, viewership on the social media. Access, affirmative action, and knowledge base. The access is there, so we are helping to transfer women to the financial services. But the affirmative action is needed. We keep on saying we need gender inclusive financial systems. I, I want to see gender responsive financial systems. The system has to be responsive to the women's needs. They are powerful on the ground. They are your clients. So don't, don't feel that you are, you are only including them. Respond to their needs. Their needs are different. You cannot harmonize all women at the same country on the same level. Strategies has to be different, and this is what we are working on uh, in Egypt. And affirmative action to have women in the central banks and in the banks reaching to decision making level. They have different views, they have different visions, and give them the chance to be on the decision making. We will not, we, we do want to keep on having sessions that are full of men if we are talking about economic issues and sessions full of women if we are talking about women issues. We don't want to see this, we want to see a positive action in the public as well. Women can do it, women can be uh, heads of central banks, women can be heads of banks. Don't be uh, uh, afraid at all, give them the chance. It will be equal opportunity, uh, competition on the same ground, but we want to see women uh, in, 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 uh, in decision making. What I want also uh, to say is rural women. Consider rural women as your agents. We are considering them as our agents on the ground. Rural women, we are, uh, with them, we are developing se se separate NGOs that they are leading on the ground to reach out for women uh, in, the, uh, in the home 
to give them the messages and also to get the women to the banks later to uh, receive uh, their services. So the rural women are powerful on the ground, give them the training and give them the financial and literacy uh, programs. What is more important is also to have financial literacy, literacy programs for the literate and the illiterate women. Because if illiterate, we want to have a, in, in a country like Egypt with, with a high percentage, unfortunately, of illiterate women, we have to make sure that we are including them as well on the ground. Um, we said, we mentioned yesterday political commitment. And political commitment is so strong in Egypt. We see that this is a golden opportunity. We have the strong political commitment by the president himself. We have the strong political commitment by the governor of the Central Bank of Egypt. And we have the needs and the demands on the ground. So joining all these aspects, we might continue the journey with success, with affirmative action, but with a strategy that we are looking, listening, and learning from women themselves, because not knowing your client is not the only strategy. Since this is created data, we are going to collect the journey of Egypt, and monitoring and evaluation of our programs as well is going to be taken into consideration. Social innovation. We are having 27 social innovation hubs within the Women Business Center of Egypt uh, throughout the, the, the villages. And the social innovation that is being, we are linking the youth of the village to provide solutions and strategies for the village itself in an innovative a digital way. So use the youth on the ground because they are a great asset and we, we should include them uh, from the beginning. If I'm talking on behalf of all the national councils or national committees on the whole, in the whole, uh, in your countries, my dream is one thing. If we can register the child, the zero year, years old, girl and boy, from the first moment of their birth, like the birth certificate, and this account will be for their education in the school, for the transfer of their fees, for their education in the universities, I, don't, I think in 20, 30 years, we're not going to talk about financial inclusion because we're going to close the uh, leakage from the beginning. And through education within the schools, the boy and the girl will know what is the importance of having a bank account that is really going to be part of his future and economic empowerment. This is a dream and please put it into consideration. And I think if we can start it with some of the banks of Egypt, give it as a corporate social responsibility and start in one double narrative and maybe we can succeed. Thank you very much. ideas of financial responses to women as opposed to financial inclusion uh, to women, which is uh, a great idea. Now, may I turn to uh, Deputy Governor Mula from Bank of Zambia, um, who also chair of the Afri Gender and Women Financial Inclusion Committee. Um, what do you see as Afri roles in women economic empowerment and what has been the uh, progress so far in the implementation of the Denial of Action Plan. Um, thank you very much. I wish to thank you, Afi, for the opportunity to participate in this panel. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank the Central Bank of Egypt for the wonderful hospitality that they have um, accorded to us so far. Um, with regard to the role of Afi, I think it's important to be very focused. AFI is a financial inclusion institution. And we need to leverage on our strength of being a financial inclusion organization. And uh, with regard to uh, what we have done so far, as I've been engaging during this uh, forum, I've been a little bit surprised to find that quite a, a good number of our members are not actually aware of the content of the General Action Plan. The General Action Plan was um, adopted in 2016 in IBFG, and um, uh, we began to implement it right away. So at the forum uh, this year, I presented 
an update to the annual general meeting. And there was a feeling that, you know, almost as if the um, presentation was in abstract because of uh, not having gone into what does the uh, actual plan itself provide for. So I'll take a little time to just uh, mention what this is. It's a 10 point plan. And uh, we must all look for it, it's on the academic side. It has also been laying around in the lobby. Uh, this is the document I wish we had um, been it up on the, on the um, screen. Um, the, the action plan uh, seeks to incorporate gender considerations in the academic uh, network's core activities with each working group to promote media learning and develop appropriate knowledge products related to gender and women's financial inclusion. And this is supposed to be done between 2016 and 2018. The plan also seeks to consider and implement best practices in integrating policies for women's financial inclusion and gender considerations within national financial inclusion strategies through AFRI's uh, financial inclusion strategies here learning group and also knowledge products are to be developed. And very importantly, um, the plan also seeks as a third point to leverage digital financial services and other innovative technologies to accelerate progress. And we heard the achievements that can be made through uh, the digital platform. The fourth point is to highlight the role of appropriate financial infrastructure, such as, as interoperable payment systems, credit bureaus, electronic collateral registries, in enabling women's financial inclusion. And the plan also invites focal points from each of the other working groups to coordinate with the uh, financial inclusion strategy planning group and lead on issues and knowledge products relating to gender and specifically women's financial inclusion according to each of their mandates. The sixth point of the plan is to develop and promote best practices in collecting, analyzing and using sex desegregated data to promote financial inclusion for women through the financial inclusion data working group and guidance including indicators will be developed to support members uh, in the collection and analysis of the data. The seventh point of the plan is that all party members to set specific financial inclusion objectives and targets for women's financial inclusion within both the framework for the, of the Maya Declaration and their national financial inclusion strategies with progress to be monitored and reported on a regular basis. And number eight, calls on financial institutions and other private sector actors, including the Africa's public private dialogue platform, to take concrete actions to better understand the women market segment, develop internal capacity, and support culture change to more effectively serve women's clients. The ninth point is to collaborate with other key stakeholders, including government, um, development partners, and civil society, to identify and research the gender-specific barriers to financial inclusion and understand gender differences relevant to product development. To advocate a business case for the financial inclusion of women, to encourage effective data collection and implementation of sound gender-specific policies for financial inclusion and to create enabling and supportive environment to accelerate women's financial inclusion. And the tenth action point is to drive greater gender diversity within the members' own institutions and its initiatives and strategies as data shows that greater gender diversity in the workplace can lead to better performance, increased productivity and innovation. And I think it's important for us to realize that all the issues that are being raised here are 
in this general action uh, plan. And therefore, why we are asking for commitments from this plan. Um, it has provided for uh, partnerships, and I think in the digital financial space, I think it's one area where we need a lot of partnerships, especially uh, from the private sector. It calls for uh, gender responsive products. And uh, a lot of work has already been done by the Afghan network in this regard. The governor's framework for implementation of um, the general action plan is a strategic uh, implementation plan which has recognized all the different actors um, uh, to realize this financial inclusion. And this starts with the other working groups, there are six, and each working group has already appointed a gender champion, a gender focal point. That is ensuring that each working group is integrating gender in their work stream. And uh, the access was uh, begun by reiterating what uh, Siri said already. The Gender and Women's Financial Inclusion Committee, which was initially set up as a temporary committee, has been made permanent in, in recognition of. In recognition of the importance of this work of uh, women's uh, uh, financial inclusion. And uh, uh, then the working groups themselves have all taken on gender into their work stream. The other partners that we collaborate with are, of course, the public private uh, dialogue partners, and engagement has already begun between the uh, Gender and Women's Financial Inclusion Committee and these partners to see uh, how we can work together to make sure that uh, we use their own competitive advantages to realize women's uh, financial inclusion. When it comes to the working groups, a lot of knowledge projects have already been developed. In fact, in total so far, eight knowledge products have, um, have been uh, uh, developed, um, ranging from integrating gender and financial inclusion uh, uh, strategies, uh, toolkits, uh, on uh, how you can uh, leverage sex disaggregated data. Um, there's also sex disaggregated data toolkit. And um, there's also SME finance policies uh, for uh, MSME owned by women and women entrepreneurs. In other words, what I'm trying to say, and this information is all available on um, the uh, AFI website, is that a lot of products are being developed to assist countries to implement at the domestic, uh, at the domestic level. And uh, also, there is an opportunity in accordance with the African platform and way of doing things for peer learning and uh, peer uh, visits even to those countries that are more advanced than others in this issue. Um, And another activity that has been mainstream within the African uh, framework is incorporating gender in all the capacity building um, initiatives that are being undertaken. And the latest group uh, that we are going to be working with are the regional initiatives. We expect the regional initiatives to be also champions at um, a regional level. And in terms of diversity, um, gender diversity, I'm pleased to also point out that uh, as of yesterday, the African board, which was previously entirely male, has acquired two new board members who are female. So African is also. Yeah, AFI is implementing what they are advocating. So we have now two uh, female board members on the board, as well as a potential um, third uh, board member. So we are expecting to see a diversity in that regard as well. And then um, in terms of um, 
the, the role of uh, the financial inclusion with regard to this morning's topic, which is uh, women's economic empowerment. I will quote Queen Maxima, who is the uh, financial inclusion ambassador. And I think she really puts it well when she says, achieving financial inclusion is not an end in itself. It is the means to an end. And I see our role here to be championing the financial inclusion of women in order to contribute to the achievement of women's economic empowerment. Thank you. Now that you've read all the uh, Ganara action plans, uh, the audience will have no excuse to say that they're not aware of it. Um, Ms. Callison, uh, from, you have shown very compelling uh, data on the relationship between financial inclusion and uh, women with economic empowerment. Now, from a personal experience, I know that access to finance don't necessarily translate into empowerment without um, prerequisite conditions such as being financially literate and have some sense of entrepreneurship. I would like to hear your thoughts on that. I agree with you. Um, and I do think there's a number of different... So we, we've, we talk a lot about a lot of different barriers to women participating more fully in the economy. And I think there are some first-order barriers that we have to overcome. We have to help women become more financially literate. We have to make sure that there are aging networks in rural areas to bring some of those services to women. Um, and I, so I do think it's very important that we, I mentioned at the end of my remarks, that we are we setting up an ecosystem that will work for women. And I love the of saying gender responsive to women versus gender inclusive. I've made that note to change what I, I, it really is exactly what we have to do. It's not necessarily giving women in the system that already exists. It's taking the system that exists and changing it and extending it to women where they are. And that will be difficult in some places. We're going to be experimenting. Uh, the Gates Foundation is hoping to experiment further in India with um, training and marketing to women better who have accounts. I mean, one big problem that arose in that country was that a lot of people opened accounts and women weren't using them. And so experimenting with how you get people to use it and teach themselves as well, I think is very important. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to take two questions from the floor of the Senate. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. And it has been a very excellent uh, presentation by the panelists. My question, well, on income levels in most developing countries. We all agree, in theory, that a drive towards financial inclusion improves the well-being of our people. However, there is a fundamental issue that has not been addressed. That fundamental issue is growth in most of these countries. Most of our people in the rural communities, some of them have virtually no income. So no matter the various channels or infrastructure we might have been putting in place to bring these people into the formal financial system could be elusive. My question to the panelists beyond the idea of promoting financial inclusion because you can put in place all the infrastructure, everything. We are talking about an ordinary farmer who depends, subsistent farming, who has even no market for his goods and services. To what extent can income help to bridge this gap? Especially in Africa, we've noticed that 
or research has proven that education is a powerful tool to move our people into the formal financial system. So when our people get access to education, especially women, then they, they, they can become financially inclusive. So my question to the panelists is, apart from the mere issue of providing mobile phone, wallet-based services to our people, what can AFI be doing to also be looking at this level, which I think has not been touched on in the panel discussion? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Thank you for the excellent question, but you raised two major hypotheses. First, that education will lead automatically to the financial inclusion of women. And I'm telling you, no. Because we have educated women that have no bank accounts. It is, it, we cannot say this out loud without having specific studies that would show that there, there is a... Uh, uh, there is a connection. Women have two places that they fear to enter. Police stations to report on violence against them and banks. These are two places that they are a little bit feared. They have the fear to enter. You said another hypothesis that farmers have low income if, or no income. I, I, I didn't hear it well, but if it is low income, the village saving lending associations that have been developed in Egypt have proven that even the poorest of the poor women have some savings to keep it aside. 18,000 women have, the poorest of the poor, have kept aside 8 million Egyptian pounds. The poorest of the poor. So it's extremely important that if we're talking about sex desegregated data, if we're talking about uh, studies, we have to be extremely careful in the hypothesis that we're raising. Yes, they are poor, but they have some saving. Yes, they are educated, but they might not have a bank account. Yes, they can reach the services, but they are not happy with the services or the customer is not happy with the financial services on the ground, so they will not enter to the bank or to enter to the credit office. From AFI here, from this conference, we need to develop, as, as my colleague on, on, in the panel said, that there is a specific knowledge product uh, uh, to be uh, used by every country, it's extremely important as well to develop these research gaps that should be in every uh, hand so we can use this knowledge on the ground as well. So research gap is extremely important. Knowledge products are important as well, but raising hypotheses that it's coming uh, genuinely but not tested on the ground might take us actually 10 years back. Poor people have something to say. Put this into consideration and just have proven by research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. 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 But the issue of uh, who are the partners that we can work with uh, to achieve other things that then lead to financial inclusion is, I think, where we should be looking. But not for us now to start seeing how can we make sure that these people first have an income before they um, uh, we start to talk about them being financially included. But what we can do also is to be creative to identify which where are the sources of income? In fact, there are no sources of income that uh, we realize which are then not created into the formal financial sector. Uh, for example, I think Liz did mention you know, what's happening in Iran and um, other countries. In my country, for, uh, for example, we do have some social cash transfers. These payments were previously being made manually and being lost by those who were responsible 
for issuing them out. There were lots of ghosts recipients. So these payments were not getting to, um, to the intended uh, beneficiaries. But with Apple, you know, uh, financial inclusion, encouraging the use of uh, the digital platform, uh, these savings, uh, these uh, transfers are now even translating into some savings because, you know, they are getting into the formal system when they are received, uh, if they are received, they are not going into a mattress which might end up, you know, getting burnt uh, if the house catches fire and so on. So we do have a role to um, capture uh, the finances that are available, whether they are very small uh, or they are bigger. But what is important is for us to help ensure, for instance, that uh, what, we, uh, what, what we are um, achieving is a financial sector that is responsive, that is affordable, uh, that is meeting the needs of the women that receive the financial inclusion. Thank you very much, Dr. Sigourney. From the first round um, of discussions, I take it that um, financial inclusion is the first barrier to reach um, economic empowerment uh, for women. Um, but there is also other elements to be looked at too. But I feel we stay focused on financial inclusion agenda. Um, there are also other organisations working on women economic empowerment. You and is working on that. Um, not women in the power, but uh, women and the ministry, um, and also other organisations more focused on financial literacy. I also think that it is very important to acknowledge the problem, like Governor from example, mentioned. Acknowledge the problem is very important, and acknowledge the fact that there may, we need many stakeholders in the process to make it happen. And from Dr. Mozzi's um, financial responsive to women, um, that's the best quote I can remember from this panel. I would like to give the uh, final word to our panelists, and you each have about two minutes um, to take in this opportunity of having the private sector, the donors, and all the members here. Um, could you say one action um, that you would like to call on the people gathered here to take to advance women financial inclusion? when they leave uh, Shasha. Uh, Ms. Kelly Simpson? Sorry, for you? It's a little hard to hear up here. Mm -hmm. One action that you would like to call on people gathering here to take to advance women's financial inclusion when they leave Shasha. I think one action would be continuing to raise the issue of are we reaching women? Um, I've just seen so much come out of the launch of the Gender Hour Action Plan, whereas three or four years ago, this was not a topic that was discussed very often among AFI members. Now, you can't escape it in every AFI forum, which is fantastic. Making sure we're taking that back to our organizations and honestly keeping that, uh, that subject at the forefront of what we do, that would be, I think, my most important uh, Thank you. Mr. Gabriel um, Thank you. I believe that there's no silver bullet uh, that uh, is available to deal with this issue. Uh, what is required is concerted efforts by all stakeholders. So, if there's one action that uh, I think I would ask for is that I, I, I would like to request all the participants at this GPF to, to reflect on your particular mandate. Having heard what you have heard and knowing that what you know now, what can you do within your control and influence to move the needle on women's economic empowerment through financial inclusion? It may be provision of financial literacy, uh, change of policy, advocating, um, legal reforms, but it's very important for you to look at yourself and say, what is it that my organization can do to make a difference to women's uh, financial inclusion? And if all stakeholders can act together, 
we will meet the targets that we have set ourselves of having um, the gender gap at um, the uh, domestic level to begin with, but ultimately to um, impact the global gender gap, which has been a sticky at 90%. We're trying to see that ultimately it can at least be at 4.5% by 2021. Thank you, Dr. Jordan. Go to uh, Governor Zanella, anywhere? Yes, I would like to have a, a small word to my peers, policy makers, the governors, and particularly legally of central banks institutions, that as we leave this meeting, it's sharp and we take the eyes that we are here to lead by example on financial inclusion issues. We can talk, it's nice to talk, and we will not be persuasive when they look at the institution that we leave, then there are issues that raise some question marks. Not so much in terms of what we say, but in terms of what we, we practice. Related to that, that means we really have to have the courage to take some bold actions, and in the process of taking all that, there are also high risks, there are risks for failure, there are bumps on the road. I know we didn't talk about it, we took that it's a smooth, but it's not a smooth process trying to address issues of gender discrimination. You know, you try, you fail, but you don't stop, you should continue the process. And if you fail the first time, it doesn't mean you should not that you are in the wrong path. You just have to keep trying and move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the Dr. Martin, you've mentioned a couple of actions already, but the last one. I think I would remind uh, all of the members and the participants of the conference of the Triple A strategy. Uh, we would like to see affirmative action in the central banks, in the banks, and the affirmative action for your clients as well. The access and the info could be reach, reaching every single woman, leaving no women behind. And the third is uh, remember that we can really do something if we register every single child, girl or boy, or, or boy since the age of birth. We might have a, a lot of difference in our strategic intervention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent. With this, we end our sessions on financial inclusion and women's economic empowerment. We will give a big round of applause to our panelists. And before we go down the stage, I would like to invite a remaining member of the Gender and Women's Financial Inclusion Committee to come up to the stage and uh, capture the momentum uh, of this year where the committee is now a permanent committee to the African network. Um, Dr. Dr. Unique, Dr. Dr. Gaia, and Dr. Dr. Lokna, uh, welcome to the stage.